Hi friends, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be looking at how to do an exploratory factor analysis or EFA and confirmatory factor analysis, also known as a CFA in R. So this is an introductory video, we're not going to go through all of the theory and it's going to be practical, it's been mainly around how to do this in R. But as we go, I'll kind of mention a few little bits and pieces to be looking out for. All of the code that we're using here today, I'll link up on my website so you'll be able to access it there and recreate all of what I do in this video. So we're going to start off with two packages that we need. So we've got the Psyche and Levan packages. I've also got Tidyverse here just because it's always very handy to have. I think I use a select or a filter somewhere in here. So if we don't have these two installed in our studio, come down to install and type them in, install them. Once we have those, we can get those set up. And the data that we're going to be using is the Holzinger Swineford 1939. This is quite a famous study. And in amongst there, we have some really useful mental ability scores of children. So this is often used as just a handy test data set. It is built into a number of different packages actually. We can just load it up and then we are going to take just the variables that have the uh, test scores for the different items that we're going to be doing these factor analyses on. In this particular data set, they're labeled X1 through to X9. So we'll take a quick look at this data. You can see we've got a few other variables in here and then X1 to X9. So before we do an exploratory factor analysis, it is good for us to have a check that the data is suitable for doing this. So the two main tests that we are going to run are the Bartlett test, which is a test of severity. And basically that what that means is we're looking to see whether there is covariance or correlations between the different items. If there isn't, then we're not going to be able to perform a factor analysis successfully. The second one, the KMO, the Kaiser Meyer Olkin, is what we call sampling adequacy. And basically what that means is that there is some amount of common variance between these items. By having that common variance, that means we're going to be able to do this exploratory factor analysis and figure out the factors where a factor is just a linear combination of the items that we're putting in here. So we're trying to see which ones of these naturally group together into these factors. When we're doing this in psychometrics, we're normally looking to see whether the questions or the items are grouping into particular domains. And so that's what we're going to have here. We're going to see whether these particular X1 through X9, they measure different things. Are there particular domains that they group into where we see commonalities between them? And instead of representing each one of them individually, we can just group them up into those factors instead. So our Bartlett test, even if we hadn't put everything I've got here, we can just dump in the data and it will figure out the rest. We'll get a little warning message. I was being a little bit more particular here. It is doing its test on the correlation matrix. So COI just gets the correlation from this data. So all of the correlations between each of X1 to X9, pass that in, tell me how many observations there are, and then it will figure it out. Uh, you can just pass in the raw data that works as well, and you'll get these same figures. What we're looking for, for this to be suitable data, is for this to be significant, so a p-value of less than 0.05. We can see here, this is scientific notation, so it's saying 1.9 times 10 to the minus 166. It's very, very small, definitely passes that test. Next up, the KMO. Different texts may have slightly different benchmarks for the KMO. We need to be looking for figures that at the very least are above 0.6. Ideally, they're above 0.8. We can see this overall of 0.75. Not quite there, but certainly close enough, certainly adequate enough for us to be go ahead and do our factor analysis. So the next step is we want to figure out how many factors we want. With this particular data set, we already kind of know in advance uh, what this should be. 
But supposing that we didn't, and that can be fairly common for an exploratory factor analysis, then we are going to do what's sometimes called a scree plot, sometimes called a parallel plot. Uh, basically what it's going to do is it's going to run through the different numbers and factors, and it's going to plot out the eigenvalues. And so basically these are a mathematical measure, we won't get into the theory on them, but they are showing us the proportion of variance that's accounted by the factors. Each additional factor, we're hopefully adding a little bit more of that. Uh, eventually, though, that's a uh, diminishing returns on adding factors. And so we're looking for a plot where there'll be a little corner to it, where we're no longer getting additional benefit from our factors. And so that is roughly indicative of how many factors, give or take. Sometimes it might be one one above, but generally it it's, gives us a pretty reasonable idea of how many factors. When we're doing development of psychometrics, we'll be doing this in conjunction with a whole lot of different items to really get a good gauge of how those items group and which ones are the best ones to be including in our factor for our particular measurement instrument that we're testing. So here's our scree plot and normally what we're looking for is what they call the elbow. So we can kind of see this point here, we've got one, two, three factors and then it kind of flattens out after that. If I didn't know anything about this data then I might in amongst my testing have a look at what a two factor and a four factor solution look like as well just out of curiosity but most likely it's going to be the three factor solution is the one that we're after and because we know the data, we know that that is the case then we're actually going to run our factor analysis so we have our function here hopefully youtube doesn't give me a strike for that one we feed in our data which is just our different items, so those x1 through x9. We specify how many factors, and then we specify the rotation. When we're doing this for psychometric purposes, we normally will have rotation in there. We can say none, and it'll do what's called a principal components analysis. So there can be applications where that is actually more useful. For this, where we're looking at some psychometrics though, this rotation aims to make our interpretation more useful, simpler and more interpretable. So we've got a couple of options. By default, uh, we have a rotation called Veramax. The one that I've put in here is called Promax. On this particular function, those are our two main options. And the big difference there is what we call uh, whether it's orthogonal or oblique. And that basically means do I think that these factors could be correlated or not? If they are orthogonal, that's like saying at 90 degrees to each other, they are uncorrelated. And quite often with psychometrics, we might be testing things where there's a reasonable chance that the things could be correlated. You can imagine that maybe it is some sort of uh, IQ related testing. We might expect that someone who is strong in one area, not perfectly predictive, but some sort of correlation to their capability in other areas, in which case we'd want to have an oblique rather than an orthogonal rotation. There are other rotation options, in fact there's many, and in a second I will show you how to access a few others. But let's have a look at this factor analysis first. When we run it, it saves to efa.result. And then if we just go print, it will give us our information. So coming down, we can see we've got the three factors. And then the scores here, these are what we call our factor loadings. So this is the relative weightings for that particular item for that factor. And we can see that we've got for factor 1, x4, x5 and x6 all weight very heavily. For factor 2, we've got x1, x2 and x3. For factor 3, we've got x7 through 9. Each of those, we can see a couple of other scores. The very, very small ones have been filtered out. And in fact, if we like, we can put this additional cutoff equals and filter out all of the little ones and so that will just show us the reasonable size ones. We come back up you can see it's just taken out those other slightly smaller ones and these have cleanly gone into the three factors so that's what we call simple structure. Come down a little bit more and we can see the proportion of variance that each factor has. All up these three factors are giving us 53.7% of the variance. So that's not too bad ideally we'd like to maybe see it a little bit higher but at least it's over half, and so for a lot of psychometrics, that's kind of the ballpark of where we expect to see it. 
rounding out our output we've got a table of correlations between our factors probably not much to read from that uh, it does it can be interesting to see what the associations are between the different factors the chi-squared statistic is telling us whether the factor model is perfectly fitting the data when we have a reasonable sample size this is always going to be significant which is telling us it does not and so generally i would say if we've got more than a sample of two as long as I'm seeing a decent percentage of the variation being loaded across the factors, that's far more important than the chi-squared statistic. Later on when we look at the CFA, we will be able to see that there's other different tests of fit that are more useful, particularly if you have a reasonable sample size. So coming down, if we wanted to use other rotation methods, then one way we can get at those is using the GPA rotation package. So install that, access the library, there'll be a number of different ones that we can then add in there as other options for our rotation. The factor analysis though we would find is pretty similar. So next up we want to do a CFA and so for this we are taking this model here so we've got the visual texture and speed factors and we want to see how well our nine items map into this exact structure. So if we were developing a psychometric instrument this is where we would be saying we've done our EFA, we've selected what we think are the best items now let's put them together into this particular instrument and see whether we get a satisfactory fit and modeling that we can say that is reasonable to be able to model these latent variables, so the things that we're not measuring directly, using the ones that we did actually collect. That's our general purpose of our CFA. I will link up this CFA example. It starts off with doing what we're doing here in this video, but it then goes into much more detail in the additional things we can be doing with this modeling. So I'll link that up and that really would be the next step in learning CFA beyond what we're doing here, which is a fairly introductory level. First thing we need to do is set up the structure of our model. And so you can see we have our three different latent variables that we are creating using the items that we've already done our EFA on. We're just storing that into a model. The syntax then for our CFA model is actually really straightforward. So we're using the CFA function, we give it the model and we give it our data. We're going to store that into an object CFA.result and then we're going to use the summary function to have a look at it. The CFA gives us a ton of output. Generally, there's not a huge amount that we would normally be quoting. So as we come down, as with our EFA, ideally we would like to see the chi-squared statistics here being non-significant. But for any decent size sample, this is really the case. So it's useful more, I guess, as a comparative. If we were looking at several models, then ideally the smaller the test statistic, the better. Quite often we will see these not quoted when we're seeing CFA. And people instead will quote some combination of these different fit indices. Commonly the Tucker-Lewis sometimes comparative fit uh, and you can have a bit of a google you'll find all of these have particular strengths and weaknesses so quite often there will be a selection of them quoted when you start to see a number of them omitted you sometimes can get a little bit suspicious about that particular model as maybe the author is cherry picking the good looking ones so comparative fit index uh, definitely one at over 0.9 ideally over 0.95 uh, the tucker lewis ideally over 0.9 so with both of these they are actually a shade under where we would like them i think if this was something that i was modeling you would probably see it described as adequate, not exemplary. So they are not so low as I would just throw this model out, but they're probably a fraction lower than what we might want to see if we were doing some sort of psychometric creation. As we come down, there's more likelihood and information criterion statistics here. These are normally not quoted, more likely to be something that you use just comparatively. If you're trying to test a few different models, figure out exactly which combination of items and factors you want. 
One that does get quoted is the root mean square error of approximation. And ideally, this one is less than 0.08. Very good if it's below 0.05, but 0.08 is the ideal. So again, this one just kind of sitting on the threshold of where you would like it. And then the root mean square residual. And this is another one where 0.05 we're pretty good. Below 0.08 is kind of okay. And you'll find that if you do a little bit of searching of the literature, different authors have come up with different benchmarks where they kind of all say, well, this is acceptable and this is ideal. Next part of our output is the actual model itself. So with these by default, what it will do is it'll lock the first item in as having a coefficient of one, and then it'll allow the remaining items in that factor to float relative to that first one. You can tell it not to do this. The norm is that we would do this, and you can just think of it as a standardization. Makes it much easier to be able to work with multiple models and to be able to compare across the different items where everything is standardized against that first item with coefficient of one. Normally what we would see is a diagram like what, what I had up before with the coefficients attached to the different arrows going between the items and the latent variable. So from here coming down, we then have the covariances between our latent variables. So we can see how each of these co-vary together and the variances of both the items that fed into our latent variables and the variables themselves. These let us check the residual variances from our items and then the variances of our latent factors. Ideally for the residual variances we want to see those being fairly small. For the variances of our latent variables we want to see some level of variability there. If there was very, very small numbers, I'd be a little bit suspicious about why there wasn't more variation in the figures. But with the interpretation of these, there's almost as much kind of art as science. And you'll find as you read different textbooks and blogs that people have some varying degree of approaches to this. So that's it for today. We've done a introductory look at EFA and CFA in R. I'll make sure that I link up all of the code that I've used so you can recreate this. I'll also link the CFA tutorial from the Levan page as well, as I think that'll be a useful extension for going further with this type of modeling. Thanks for watching, and I'll be back really soon with more videos on R, Stats, AI, and random stuff.